Hello, and welcome to today's event on how policymakers can support drone delivery. My name is Becca Trait. I'm a policy analyst at the Center for Data Innovation, focusing on the future of retail and the e-commerce industry. We've heard a lot about the potential for drone delivery for about 10 years now. Startups and major retail companies both have the technology and required licenses to operate drones for service delivery. But even with that, we haven't really seen drone delivery expand and become as ubiquitous as we would expect. It isn't widely available for most products still. Today, in this conversation, we're going to explore why that might be and what policymakers, both at the state and the federal level, can do to support the adoption of drone delivery. Today's event is supposed to be an open discussion, so for those watching online, if you would like, you can submit and vote on questions using Slido. If you're watching on our website, you can find the link below the video, and if you're watching on another streaming service such as YouTube, you can find the link in the video description. We also encourage you to share your thoughts and reactions to the event on Twitter or social media using the hashtag data innovation. We have a really great lineup of panelists today. Please welcome Brian Buds and Scott Schoftman. Hi, Brian. Brian is the Deputy Administrator at the Michigan Department of Transportation, Office of Aeronautics. He also serves on Michigan's Unmanned Aircraft Systems Task Force. Scott is the Senior Manager of Grassroots Advocacy and Chapter Engagement at the Association for Uncrewed Vehicle Systems International. Hi, guys. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Of course. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, I guess we can just get started if you're both ready. Um, Scott, would you like to start us off? I was just wondering if you could maybe give a rundown about what it takes for a retailer to become certified to operate a drone for delivery. Yeah, so here in the United States, the Federal Aviation Administration or the FAA are the ones that have the jurisdictional and you know declaratory kind of regulatory power to approve operators. Uh, you know, we have a couple of different ways. There's part 107, if you don't know, that's essentially the federal rule that allows for commercial operations of drones. If you're doing something and it's for money, you need to have a part 107 license or certification. Uh, one other area where we're seeing a lot of drone delivery happening is under what's called part 135. So essentially you have a drone delivery company that is getting certified as an aircraft carrier, you know, similar to what you'd see large scale FedEx, UPS, that side of things. And, and some of those companies are actually in the space. And so that means that they need to have programs in place and manuals and, and safety uh, in place to look at what is the, how's the aircraft going to operate? How is the maintenance going to come into play? What other safety things are they considering across the, the whole of the operation? It's not just about being able to turn on the drone, pick it up, push a button and send a package to where you want to send it. It's about making sure that access to the airspace is safe that you're not putting any other aircraft at risk, that you're not putting people and property on the ground at risk. And all of that comes into play in the part 135 version of it and also in the part 107 version of it. So those are a couple of the pathways that you would need to go through if you wanna do drone delivery commercially here in the United States. There's a lot of other things that come along, but that's sort of the easiest explanation of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And the, would you just mind, again, like the main difference between 107 and 135? Could you just reiterate what that is? So with part 107, there are restrictions around drones that cannot operate above 400 feet. You can't fly mm -hmm. over people. You can't fly uh, beyond visual line of sight. These are certain things that you can waive unless you're talking about beyond visual line of sight. That's one thing you can't do under 107 when you're carrying the property or goods of another for compensation. Part 135 allows some of those restrictions to go away based on the plans that are put up, put in place and agreed to between the operator and the FAA so that goods can be delivered beyond visual line of sight because you're using mitigations, whether that's people on the ground that are looking at the airspace or you have a combination of technology that helps you make sure that the drone can see and avoid other aircraft or obstacles mm -hmm. that might get into the pathway. Awesome. Um, Brian, so that what Scott is talking about is the FAA certification. And so that's required, obviously, at the federal level. The FAA is a federal organization. But at the state level, if you do have your FAA, say you have you have your 107 or you have your part 135, um, what sort of like requirements from a state perspective? And of course, you can just speak to Michigan since that's where you're located. But what sort of requirements do retailers then also have to like overcome in order to operate their drones as delivery vehicles? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. I think this this is one where we're, I think, collectively from a state and also from Michigan, it's still something that a lot of states are feeling out a little bit. Obviously, as Scott has mentioned, there's there's a 
uh, an airspace preemption and a, and a regulatory control preemption that we're trying, we in Michigan are trying to be very respectful of FAA's role in the certification of aircraft pilots, all those sorts of things. Uh, on the state side, there's a lot of land use control and planning and, and facility licensing perspective, which is a lot of the roles that we do today for traditional aviation, that we're spending a lot of our time here in Michigan looking to the future of, hey, when small UAS package delivery or AAM becomes a little bit more of a reality, how do we integrate that into the transportation system that exists in the state today? But also, how do you integrate those local concerns to the the zoning, the noise, all of those sorts of things, which states generally have the power to, to help regulate and, and enforce in some instances. Um, so that's where we're spending a lot of time of, of trying to prepare in partnership with our federal partners and in industry to make sure that that as this becomes a reality, it's it's not an undue burden on any uh, you know segment of the community or anything like that, but also really does enable some of those advanced operations. So. Um, it's, it's an interesting jurisdictional partnership for sure, but I think um, got to give big kudos to FAA and, and a lot of our local partners here of, of working together to make sure that we address all those concerns together. Would you, so talking about some of those barriers, what are some, you mentioned obviously like noise requirements and Scott, you had mentioned um, beyond line of sight, like those FAA requirements, but what are some of the like local state and federal concerns about drones like small drones that are being used for delivery like what are if I've, like brian from your perspective as somebody who deals with a lot of local organizations who deals at the state level um what are some of the main concerns that people have and then also communities have when they think about drone delivery coming into their community yeah great question i think so so you mentioned the, the michigan uas task force that started probably about five years or so ago in michigan it was really when small UAS started to, to become a thing in general, even before package delivery. And a lot of the concerns locally here stem from um, sort of the traditional safety and security related concerns. There's a lot of, of um, prison and jail related concerns. There's the um, traditional surveillance sort of concerns that exist out there and also uh, we heard a lot about the noise concerns and the general nuisance uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So, that, you know, within the state here, we passed a couple of uh, pieces of legislation as a result of the task force's work to not only, with, again, with the respect of the preemption issue and, and trying to act in our lane of putting laws in place that restrict the use of UAS in terms of their impact on folks on the ground. So we had, you know, Michigan has a has a statute that deals with what we call key facilities, which is essentially our critical infrastructure. And originally it started out of, you know, hey, maybe we should put a proposal out there that says you can't fly within X number of feet of a facility. And we kind of said, hey, you know, you got to be careful in those airspace restriction type of things. But there may be an avenue to say, hey, you can't use a drone to uh, infringe upon the work of a police officer or something like that. So we tried to thread mm -hmm. that needle on that front a little bit. So safety and security was the big concern. And I think now is, as it's becoming more a reality of, hey, these might be operating in neighborhoods, we're spending a lot of time on that proper land use, uh, local zoning, planning, airspace protection, those sorts of things in Michigan. Awesome. And then Scott, would you speak to maybe some of the federal regulations or federal barriers? Yeah, so one of the things I wanted to mention first is that we do have a, a lot of crossover at the state and local level, you know, that the issues that Brian's mentioning are not unique just to Michigan and that AVSI as an organization, we've got 30 chapters around the country where we work with either small business owners, individual operators, or people that are part of larger companies to bring that story to lawmakers. So we work very heavily in trying to find what's the right balance in legislation that gets states prepared for let's consider the powers that we have as state and local government, as well as what are the powers of the federal side. So we put together an educational campaign last year called Drone Prepared, have model legislation in there and actually got a piece of that passed in Mississippi this past year by working with you know municipal leagues and, and counties and sort of understanding what are those considerations that we wanna make sure that we're aware of about 
concerns on privacy and, and property and nuisance and, and all that. So it's it's understanding sort of where that crossover starts and ends. And then from a federal perspective, I would say that the things that we want to make sure are not holding us back are the regulatory rules. So one of the things that the FAA actually just recently put out is the called the UAS fact sheet. So they originally put out a version of this in 2015. And it talked about sort of where do those delineations lie? What are the powers that state and local governments have? What are the powers the FAA has? They just updated it for the first time in eight years to very clearly uh, point to things like state and local governments cannot establish highways in the sky. You're not going to have these navigation easements. It, those are strictly within the powers of the, the federal government and of the FAA. The FAA is really concerned about airspace access, air navigation, safety, and making sure that anything that deals with those types of issues is within the purview of the FAA. So they work very closely with manufacturers and operators on what it takes to get from clean sheet aircraft to something that they feel comfortable allowing to fly in commercial operations in the national airspace over the general public, right? Um, you know, if you're talking about things that are slowing down the process of getting from, we have an idea, we, we have mm -hmm. a customer that wants to use us, uh, it really depends on how large the aircraft is that you want to operate, what kind of things that you want to carry, when and where you want to do that operation. So it's uh, part 107 in most generally small UAS are considered 55 pounds or less. There are some companies that are working on drones that are 55 pounds and more. So they have to go through this process called 44807. So that's just essentially a prior version of the FAA reauthorization or the current federal aviation rules. Uh, it allows for operators to be able to carry more than 55 pounds all up weight of the aircraft in the national airspace to do delivery. And so there's a lot of rulemaking and background assessment that has to happen, like uh, environmental reviews and, and other impact assessments that have to happen to be able to fly an aircraft that's that large, as well as normal small aircraft. And just to clarify, the 55 weight total is talking about the total weight. So that would be the aircraft plus whatever it's carrying. Yeah, that's because the aircraft I itself think, and whatever cargo. And whatever cargo. Yeah, because we've seen a lot of kind of switching to the technology side, like the actual drones themselves. We've seen a lot of companies. I know, um, I think off the top of my head, Amazon has a drone that previously was under 55 pounds, but was restricted on the like weight of cargo it could carry. It could only carry up to, I think like 5.6 pounds perhaps because at a certain point it reached over the limit because the drone was heavier and they're working on making these drones either smaller or lighter or have more advanced capabilities so that they're able to clear these barriers without being, you know, like a 70 pound drone that's carrying a 20 pound package. Um, would either of you be able to speak to sort of the technology that might be needed to reach those levels to have drones that are like smaller? Do they need greater thrust? Do they need more propellers? I'm not super, I don't have a great understanding of the technology, but a little. I could speak to it. You know, we've, we've had a lot of advancements in things like battery technology, as far as the mm -hmm. energy density of the, the actual batteries themselves, just based on the chemistry with the huge adoption that we've seen in electric vehicles on the ground, that's caused a lot of advancement in battery technology. So the amount of operational time that you'd be, be able to get out of the aircraft. And part of it's just, what is the specific concept of operations that you have? How far do you want to be able to fly the drone? How much, how heavy of a package do you want to be able to deliver? And if you can zero in on that, you've seen a number of companies look towards sort of those smaller packages, like five pounds or less, which honestly make up the large majority of orders that these companies are getting, whether you're talking about a Walmart or an Amazon or, you know, a wing that's operating in uh, Virginia, right? Um, they, so if you zero in sort of on what is the use case you want, that helps then define what are the operational and design characteristics that you need for your aircraft. Um, and you, you see companies making different design choices based on, do they want to have a whole host of small motors or do they want some a few fewer larger motors and sort of what are the design considerations that you take into account when you do that um, all of those sort of weigh into what the risk is you know if the drone happens to crash what would potentially be the impact if you've mm -hmm. got more motors or less motors or what kind of material the, the, the drone is made out of if it's styrofoam or if it's carbon fiber and do you have a parachute on board so sort of all of those kinds of things play into the considerations of how they design a drone based on what they want to do with it and based on any risk impact that it would have in sort of an off nominal type of operation. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, 
One of the things that I think is interesting, especially when we think about the design of drones, is currently the FAA doesn't have specific regulations beyond like the 55 pound weight for what a drone to be a delivery drone needs to like have or what it needs to be. And I wonder if we're thinking about the future of drone delivery and how do we make it more accessible and more ubiquitous across the board to everyone, would it be more effective to have kind of specific guidelines that companies could follow when they're designing their drones? Like in in your opinion, either of you. And also, do you think there may be a future where states have specific specifications that they would want to have for drones that are operating in their locations? Oh, good question. I think to the to the state to the state portion of that, I'd say probably not in terms of certification of aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, for us, you know, whether it's on our traditional airport side or on the UAS side, we rely. There's a concept called critical aircraft, and, and it's used to design the airports existing today. And mm -hmm. I think that's where many states are trying to keep an eye toward as, you know, more package delivery UAS come into reality, we can see more what those performance capabilities are and what those needs on the ground are. Because a lot of what we spend time doing is protecting approaches and the area right around the facility that they're landing at today. I mean, if they're all true traditional vertical takeoff and landing UAS, that footprint's mm -hmm. pretty small. If some of them need some additional, you know, an approach like a traditional aircraft, in some case, we've got to adjust a little bit there. Um, that's where we're spending a lot of time of, hey, you know, let's see where industry goes in terms of aircraft capabilities, and then we can try to plan around that. So there's a couple of concepts on how you would write uh, restrictions or certifications. Um, one of them would be performance-based, and one would be prescriptive. So mm -hmm. overall, I would say we would lean towards performance-based. Essentially, you, you set a bar of performance that you would like aircraft to meet. And then you leave it up to the the operators, the manufacturers, to come up with the right way to meet that standard. Then the FAA will say, "Okay, we agree with you. That meets that standard. We'd like to certify it for operations." Uh, if you look at traditional aircraft, there's a, a pathway called type certification for larger traditional aircraft, where we've only had one mm -hmm. drone go through that that process and receive a type certificate. That's through from a company called Matternet. Their M2 uh, UPS uses that aircraft, uh, I think, believe in North Carolina to do medical delivery. They've also been using it outside of the country. You know, so one of the things we have to consider here in the United States are, are our regulatory and certification pathways really serving the companies here that want to operate? Or are they going to just push out and be working in places like Australia or Europe, where we know a lot of these operations are already happening? And how do we consider that as part of the safety continuum that we are willing to allow access to the NAS or that our public wants to see, right? So um, yeah, I would say we'd lean more towards performance-based type regulations versus something that's really prescriptive saying you must use this part or you must do mm -hmm. this specific way because these drones have a lot of differing characteristics in the way that they want to operate as well as the way they want to deliver, whether that's, you know, flying at 100 feet and using a winch to drop a package to the ground or coming down low, opening up and dropping a package. There's a lot of different ways to accomplish the same thing in a safe way. So performance really allows for some flexibility while setting a minimum bar for capabilities. Mm -hmm. Is there a need for a minimum, when we talk about like a minimum bar for capability, is just to clarify, is that talking about things like weight restrictions? Is that talking about like how far a drone can travel or things like, oh, if it crashes, what is going to happen? Like what type of performance-based metrics, in your opinion, do you think would exist? So on that front, it's Durability and reliability is, is one of the sets of terminology that you'd see in mm -hmm. measuring or you know, benchmarking an aircraft of how often do you need to change specific parts on it? What is an acceptable amount of time where you may have an issue where a battery would, would fail or propellers would, would not last? Or if you do crash, what happens to the aircraft? Does it break into smaller pieces? Do you have a parachute on board that allows the aircraft to slow down to a specified speed? So you're comfortable with the amount of impact that it's going to have when it gets to the ground, you know, or there's things like maximum speeds that you allow the, the aircraft to travel. There are 
whether like what are the capabilities that sort of the flight envelope of how much mm -hmm. can a drone turn or roll what kind of wind could it uh, be able to fly through can it fly in rain sort of understanding that the requirements and as well as the available types of operations that the drones can do and a lot of these companies have very rigorous test and operational campaigns that they put these aircraft through they probably cannibalize a ton of aircraft just in that testing process so they can get to a point where mm -hmm. it's this specific formulation of foam works the best based on how it you know deforms under impact or how well it handles wind all of that kind of thing alongside the, the technological rigor of we know that we have a connection that works very well over this distance on this specific frequency we have mm -hmm. this amount of of latency all of those kinds of things are, are part of the overall sort of holistic picture of this is the performing type of aircraft that we like to see it meets the requirements it's safe mm -hmm. um on that question brian i was just wondering if you could give us a little information or a little guidance on how so from the state perspective, when the state is, as somebody who serves on an unmanned aircraft systems task force, when you're making recommendations and when you're thinking about how to make unmanned systems and drones safer or more accessible or more um, feasible for people to use, how would you consider the need for testing? Do you think that how would you recommend that testing be done to make sure drones are meeting some of those performance requirements if that were a system that you were going to take? Yeah, this is a good question. I'm going to share a little personal opinion, a little state perspective, I think. Yeah, too. of course. Um, I think, again, kudos to FAA for taking sort of the crawl, walk, run approach on testing with um, the test sites originally and IPP and beyond and, and partnering with state and local governments on those. I think that's a huge step in seeing, hey, you know, in a relatively safe environment, is this feasible in general? I think that's mm -hmm. great. The, the personal opinion from my perspective is is those are great first steps, but I think we got to push it a little further now to see truly what the capabilities are, but maintain a, a, an eye on that safety portion. And I think that's where we are at in Michigan of, you know, generally the safety and security concerns have been addressed for the most part. There's always bad actors and they'll all, you know, we'll have to address those as they come up. But I think for us, we're trying to take you know, as data driven of an approach as possible to this. And, and a lot of that is looking at, at the risk profiles that exist, you know, in the area of operations of any particular user. What's the ground risk look like? What's the air risk look like? How can we mitigate that safely? And I mm -hmm. think that's where with the, with the partners that are existing in the state today that want to drive beyond visual line of sight forward, that's where we're spending a lot of time and resources is, hey, how can we help you provide that safety data, collect that safety data to provide that in turn to our federal counterparts to say, hey, look, even in a short haul flight, we can do this safely. We've mitigated the risk here from, from the safety perspective. Maybe now we're prepared to take the next step of adding, you know, a quarter mile or a half mile or whatever the situation may be while providing that, you know, we're talking about command and control and surveillance and those sorts of things to provide that data back to FAA. And then on the states, you know, in the state regulatory purview there, we can help on the land use side of, hey, look, these are locations that have, you know, the right conditions to do this safely that, hey, if something were to happen that's a safety concern, obviously there's all the on onboard traditional systems that exist today to help mitigate that but also we can find some good spots that, hey, if something goes bad, we're not gonna be in somebody's backyard or in a business mm -hmm. or something like that. So that's where we spend a lot of time on the data collection and safety case building side here in Michigan. Before we jump more into some of the concerns like visual or beyond visual line of sight, would one of you mind explaining what that term means just so our audience is fully aware? I'm, I'm happy to do that. My, my background prior to joining AVSI was running my own drone service company. So I was out there in the field flying drones for a business. You know, I was out in California doing wildfire assessment, you know, flying power lines, all that kind of stuff. So when it comes to beyond visual line of sight, essentially what you're talking about is being able to see and understand the, the, the direction and, and way the drone is operating unaided, you know, no binoculars. If you wear glasses, that's fine, but not 
you know, being able to physically understand the airspace that the drone is operating in and where the drone is heading, right? So you, depending on the person and depending on the size of the drone itself, that can vary as well as the atmospheric or otherwise conditions. Like if you have a bunch of tall trees, your visual line of sight is going to be different just based on the angle that you're operating. So mm -hmm. um, that's sort of the easiest explanation of it. It's being able to physically see and understand where the drone is in relation to other aircraft that might be in the airspace or other obstacles on the ground. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's one of those terms that pops up all the time, but having like a really clear definition is always so helpful because especially for delivery, obviously you kind of have to move beyond the visual line of sight. It doesn't make a ton of sense to have a, well, in some cases it might, but it doesn't make a ton of sense if you're ordering a package from a warehouse that's three miles from your house, that you're going to be able to see it if you're the operator three miles away. You're not going to be able to see that. So thinking about beyond visual line of sight, what sort of capabilities are needed to answer concerns about that? So a lot of drone operators now have capabilities where they can operate drones, but they don't get a waiver to do things beyond visual line of sight. So what sort of capabilities are needed to be able to certify drones and what sort of safety concerns have to be answered before that can be a more widely available uh, ability? From a regulatory perspective, the, the FAA, not this past year, but the year before, had an aviation rulemaking committee or an ARC mm -hmm. around be, beyond visual line of sight. So that was a mixture of people from the industry itself that are building these aircraft and want to operate them to government partners, to traditional aviation associations or operators, to privacy industry and, and concerns, right? So there's a lot of discussion about what are things that we need in place? And the, the truth of it is we, we need some rules in place beyond what we already have. And mm -hmm. so that report was released, I believe, last year in March with a whole set of recommendations about, uh, you know, pilot certification rules, about the kinds of technology. If you look at the existing traditional aviation side, there's this thing called see and avoid. So if you're in an aircraft, it's a mm -hmm. 91113 in the FARS, uh, you need to be able to see and avoid other aircraft. So what is a way that a drone could effectively see and avoid? And is that technological means? Is that somebody on the ground who's visually assessing the airspace? What's a way for us to safely scale from one to many or you know, from one mile to five miles to beyond? Mm -hmm. um, as well as what are sort of reliable acceptance measures for uh, communication? What are, you know, if something bad happens, you lose connection, what does the drone do in that type of a situation? So mm -hmm. off nominal, it, it's considering sort of the whole host of what could go right, but also what could go wrong? How do we put in place performance and, and rule measures that would make the public comfortable with this, that would make the other people that are flying comfortable with this? Because the last thing we want to see or hear about is a mid-air collision, either between a drone and an aircraft or a drone and a drone or, or anything, right? So what are ways that we make pe people feel comfortable, that we make operations realistically safe? And, and the easiest way to do that is to start with rules and concept of operations and actually having some of these drones out there flying, which is what they're mm -hmm. doing. It's it's what one of the things that Brian touched on through the, the test sites and through states and local governments that are investing in infrastructure, whether that's radar or communications links or doing assessments of what does our specific local jurisdiction offer from a challenges and benefits perspective that others don't. And so mm -hmm. we're pushing on the FAA to give us a final rule on beyond visual light of sight operations. We're likely going to see a notice of proposed rulemaking in February of next year is what we've been told. Then mm -hmm. there will be a comment period where people can assess, essentially rip apart and provide suggestions on this rule is good because of this or it's bad because of that. And then they come out with a final rule and there's more comments. So we could still be two, three plus years to that in place. And so what do we do in the meantime to allow these operations to happen beyond the scale that they're happening right now? Mm -hmm. um, spe touching upon that, you mentioned that, you know, uh, there are concerns about what about like a drone to drone collision and what about these things that like could happen and the value of test sites. But I do think one thing that's important to touch on is that there are 
drones being operated that aren't necessarily delivery drones. So one thing that I think is very cool about drones is they have a lot of potential to be used to track the impact of climate change. So you can use drones to see things like the ice caps melting, and you can use drones to look at wildfires. As you touched upon, Scott, you had previously done work out in California, visual, like using drones to visualize things like wildfires. And then even in Michigan, um, Brian, I had seen recently that the University of Michigan is using drones locally in order to transport medicine to and from the hospital. Um, and so we do have a lot of drones that are operational right now, but I'm wondering how we would move from seeing these drones that we are using for things like infrastructure, for things like environmental concerns, to look at to move towards drones that are used for delivering things and how we can make them more accessible to consumers. Because we do have a lot of information about how these drones have a lot of uses in public spaces already. Yeah, I can share a little perspective on that. I think it builds on the previous question too, and, and I'd echo Scott's comments wholeheartedly on the rulemaking side. Um, it, here in Michigan, we, we have the opportunity within our Department of Transportation to, part, to partner with our uh, Michigan Economic Development Corporation, who's looking on the economic development side of, of this industry, too. And, and the question I think that always comes up is, you know, whatever, whatever company you pick or whatever industry, it's, hey, how can I really operationalize? And really, we're talking about beyond visual and line of sight. How do we really do that? And I think mm -hmm. that to, to Scott's question on the rulemaking or to Scott's comment, basically the 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 paradigm that exists today is kind of one off approvals of, you know, you put together your specific concept of operations, submit it and see if FAA uh, is on board with it. And mm -hmm. I think that's the, you know, the big players in the industry have the horsepower to go through that process where a lot of the, the smaller industry players maybe don't. And I think that's where a lot of the concern exists of, hey, there really needs to be a repeatable, scalable process to get this approval done so that it can become more mainstream and more mm -hmm. um, applicable to folks. So um, I'd echo that comment for sure. I think that's a that's a, a good point. I think that might be the core point of, hey, without those rules beyond visual line of sight is a tough nut to crack for most folks. So, yeah, yeah. Um, on both of those comments, especially as we think about beyond visual line of sight, do we expect um, that some of these things may be accelerated with the FAA Reauthorization Act happening very, very soon? It's um, up for debate and it's up in committee right now. So how can we expect drone operations to kind of change in light of that? Uh, we've been heavily involved with Congress and the Hill on both the House version and the yet to be passed Senate version of FAA reauthorization, you know, it, it's very helpful for us to have good communication and connections on the Hill that reach out to us about proposed amendments to the bill or, or you know, getting our feedback on items that have been put in. So I, I think that it's helpful that the Congress understands that this is a very useful potential operation to happen here in the United States, whether that's from a workforce perspective, whether that's from just an access and equity to uh, needing goods mm -hmm. and things of that nature. So we have a Congress that's absolutely leaning in on what are ways that we can speed up and make this more repeatable. Um, mm -hmm. There are a number of amends, amendments that have been included in the House version and the Senate version, we're still waiting. There's some issues that are outside of drones that are holding up that process. And right now that we're in August, we're still in the congressional recess. So hopefully when the Senate comes back, they'll be ready to do their markup and we'll be able to get to a full five-year reauthorization bill that is conferenced and, and passed out of, of both houses. What we may end up seeing is some sort of short-term extension to the FAA reauthor reauthorization bill. So essentially it's the, the base piece of legislation that funds the whole FAA for all of their operations. So there's a lot of stuff in there beyond just drones. But mm -hmm. one of the things that we've absolutely been pushing on are, look, there are a lot of these operations that are already happening. The FAA mm -hmm. actually put out a uh, request for comment on, I think it was four different types of operations as well as you know, visual line of sight in general in the federal register, which we commented on. And it's anything from long linear inspection like power lines to delivery to uh, using infrastructure inspection. Like if you're within 
essentially what's called shielded operation. So you're close enough to a building that other aircraft shouldn't be there, or if they are, they're probably in a pretty bad situation. And so <laughs> as more companies essentially apply to the FAA for these waivers and exemptions, they then put mm -hmm. those out for comment. And if they find ways of, all right, we're seeing this over and over again, how do we get to something that's repeatable that we understand the risk profile and perspective of how companies are going to address and respond to this? Yeah. So I, I think that beyond Rioff itself, which hopefully will be helpful in giving the FAA that extra nudge of, yes, we would like you to push in that direction to make more of these operations happen in a more timely manner, as well as some of these other sort of not cookie cutter completely types of waivers and exemptions, but those that sort of sing a similar tune, right? That mm -hmm. they understand the risk profile and the operation that's going to happen similarly. So that it's, it's something that the FAA should feel comfortable approving and allowing to happen. We've been mentioning waivers a lot. So I just want to like really quickly step back. Would you be able to define, define what type of waivers drone companies typically get just so the audience is aware of how those waivers are used and like why a waiver is needed if you have, for example, like a 107 or a 135 certification? So when I first started talking about 107, I talked about the restrictions of the rule itself. So being able mm -hmm. to fly over 400 feet or being able to fly over yeah. people and moving vehicles. Those are a couple of things that you can get waivers to part 107. If you look at part 135, essentially, like I said, you're taking a full aircraft, you know, delivery operation. So there are things that just don't exist on a drone. Like there are no doors, there are no seat belts. There, there's no way to carry a, a physical manual on board the drone. But mm -hmm. what are corollaries? Like, okay, it's at the operator station. And so mm -hmm. it's those kinds of things from waiver to exemptions to that, as well as something like beyond visual line of sight. And uh, you know, those come into play when the operator then submits documentation to the FAA to get them comfortable with the idea that we should allow this operator to go beyond the existing regulations that are in place because they have put in these safety mitigations that mm -hmm. get us to an equivalent level of risk if somebody were not operating outside of those bounds. What would be, so when we think about a lot of these waivers that you mentioned, like really commonly come up and eventually, hopefully the FAA would realize, oh, well, like this is a really common way to address these issues. And so we should include this in, you know, any sort of regulations that we have surrounding the use of delivery drones. Do you think that there is a way that this could be formalized so that there's a more effective and accelerated path for bringing delivery drone operations from ideation to actually being able to deliver to deliver products in terms of like what that might look like if something like that were to be included in the like final FAA reauthorization act obviously to whatever degree you can speak to that so i don't think that the FAA reauthorization act in and of itself is going to put out these kind of foundational next level changes or rules. That's something mm -hmm. that would come from a BB loss NPRM. So we have part 107. One of the things that mm -hmm. got discussed in the ARC is called part 108 affectionately. So think of that as like pilot and certification testing rules that might come into place for beyond visual line of sight operations. Uh, one thing that we used to have was you couldn't fly a drone at night. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you had to get a waiver for that. And so now based on updated versions of uh, testing and training that come as part 107, you can operate at night. As long as you meet, you've done the training through the FAA, you have uh, strobe lights that can be seen by other aircraft or three statute miles. And so you, you understand sort of the risks of flying at night and that the FAA is comfortable with the amount of operations that already had happened at night over a number of years. And so as we start to build up more and more delivery operations, seeing what are things that the FAA is comfortable with, what can they train more broadly on and sort of meet that base case of we're comfortable with this and that type of operation could happen with more of a rubber stamp type. You've met the training, you've provided us with the documentation. It's not overly risky given the mm -hmm. all of the considerations around that operation. And I think that's one of the kind of interesting things is FAA has started to publish more of those waivers that that mm -hmm. approved. We went through this as a state agency operating UAS too of, hey, how do we, you know, how do we try to tackle some of those advanced operations? And and not that there's a one size fits all in those waivers, but at least gives potential operators a good basis point of, hey, here's where some of those operational requirements are coming from. And here's, you know, obviously what FAA approved. 
I think those are good baby steps, and, and you know, and I think that's FAA circular, you know, publicizing those a little bit to get industry feedback a little bit as well. But but I think those are a nice good first step. Also, obviously, in addition to reauthorization and rulemaking, but you know, that's a good first step of of starting to talk about some of those advanced operations and those waiver requests too. One other thing I wanted to mention was on these waivers and exemptions are that they're very labor intensive from an FAA perspective. Mm -hmm. Companies have to submit, FAA has to review and approve. And so from a staffing perspective, it takes a lot of resources, whether that's staff or time or other interorganizational uh, collaboration that has to happen to do all of the assessment. So I think as we get more to a place where we're streamlining the types of uh, operations that come through, we're also freeing up FAA resources or if we're not going to go that route, we need to make sure that the FAA is correctly funded to be able to handle this influx of these kinds of more complex waivers and exemptions requests that, that come in. So part of what we've done is ask for more headcount at FAA in certain areas mm -hmm. based on feedback that we've had talking to the different arms of, of the association itself or of, of the, and trying to find ways that we're making sure that Congress understands what goes into making these operations happen. And if that yeah. means financial resources, headcount, what are ways that we can help get that message across? Yeah, no, I definitely agree, Scott. And I think one thing that's interesting, thinking about like the work that the FAA has to take on to sort of do all these waivers and do all these certifications is how long we've been hearing about drones and how like drone delivery specifically and how slowly we've seen it actually start to expand. And I think a lot of people for a long time have been like, I've been hearing about like products being delivered by drones since like 2018. Like it's 2023. I thought I read an article five years ago that Walmart got a, an approval to like operate. And so why am I never seeing this? And why is this not an option? And one of the things that it always comes back to is it's so labor intensive and having all of those waivers like require such a level of testing and such a level of concern about safety. And Brian, you had mentioned, um, from the state perspective, from the state task force, you do so much testing and you have to collect all of that data. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to how all of the data you collect, how you use it to make any sort of decisions or recommendations, if that's about safety or if that's about um, like consumer interest in drones and what you do with that data once you have it. Yeah, great question. I, I think that's one of the things we've always sort of struggled with at the state levels when you hear those sort of to the press release comment of, you know, you know, delivery operations occurring in whatever community. Mm -hmm. it, you know, generally, those are not generally not beyond visual line of sight delivery okay. operations, but they take those. It's it's that building block approach of, hey, you got to go out and feel the technology a little bit. And even if it's flying across the street, You've got that sort of repeatable flight operation that you can monitor all the different factors, the altitudes, the airspeeds, what it's flying over, and and follow the you know normal flight operations. But also, when something bad goes happen, you know something bad happens, you can see what occurs and where it goes. So, so that's where we're spending a lot of time of, you know. So over the course of the last year and a half, we, we conducted a feasibility analysis of three particular mm -hmm. areas within the state of, hey, what, do, what would it take to take those first steps of, of initial within visual line of sight and then beyond visual line of sight operations in three different areas in the state? And, and the, the areas that we studied was, was one of our northern communities that's, that's a more urbanized environment right at its core, but becomes very rural and becomes, you know, uh, sort of over water connecting the two peninsulas mm -hmm. of Michigan, which present a lot of issues in itself. And then we picked a couple of locations uh, in our more urbanized Detroit environment and also the international border crossing, which is a whole nother ball game that we could talk on if you'd like as well. But, um, you know, for us, it's really building, it, it comes back to building that safety case. And if you can show those repeatable flight operations that are occurring safely, um, you know, generally that that's what FAA is looking for in terms of approving those advanced operations, but also on our sort of state regulatory hat, we are mm -hmm. looking at those sort of land use planning controls of, hey, you know, whatever you call a landing facility for a drone or if it's one of the mailbox concepts or, or one, any of the things out there, you know, what's the right spot to put that? Is it a transit mm -hmm. facility? Is it the end of the street? Is it, you know, 
there's all kinds of versions of, of what that might look like, but that's where we're spending a lot of time, you know, not to keep saying the same thing, but on <laughs> sort of that land use planning side of, yeah, depending on what this looks like, it's going to require some different things. And, and that's where we're trying to spend some time looking at that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's like so excellent. I would love really briefly, if you would talk about some of the, um, difficulties and sort of aspects that come because Michigan is a border state and you do have an international border right there. Some of the different concerns that Michigan ex exclusively sort of faces, sort of having that unique border. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, you know, the story's changed a little bit since COVID happened. And then we had, uh, had different uh, trade disputes and things like that, that all Im impacted the international commerce between you know, the U.S. and Canada or Michigan and Ontario, however you want to look at it. Um, it's, it's a huge economic impact for us in the state, particularly some of our big manufacturers that have facilities on both sides of the border. And what we saw during COVID and when there were border shutdowns um, mm -hmm. and the trade disputes was, hey, you know, factory across the border had a mechanical malfunction and the, you know, the quote unquote widget to fix that's on this side of the border but we can't get the, you know, hand sized thing over to the factory to fix the, the machinery. And mm -hmm. that you know, causes, you know, 20, 30, $40 million of downtime because that part can't get over there. And we're sort of sitting there that you can sit up, you know, you can sit on the riverfront in Detroit and basically almost, you know, if you had a good arm, you could throw the thing over the international border and get it over to Canada. So that's where we've, we've engaged a lot of federal partners to have that discussion of, hey, we understand there are legitimate safety, security, customs, border protection, all of those concerns that exist. Mm -hmm. But this technology, I mean, you could sit there and maintain visual line of sight to the drone across the border here. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we can think outside the box a little bit in terms of the, the physical aspect of border crossing to yeah. help build that case. So um still a work in progress for sure but lots of good discussions occurring within faa and with the state on on trying to push that forward ever so slightly more to come on that i think here in the near future but but an exciting topic for sure no yeah that's so exciting and it's so interesting especially because michigan is one of the few states where it's like you really can fully look across the border if you're standing in detroit you can look at canada and be like there it is um, I think we're going to switch over to audience questions because we're sort of running up to time here. We have about 10 or so minutes left. Um, our first question says, will consumers in the District of Columbia and surrounding Maryland and Virginia suburbs ever be able to benefit from drone delivery? Um, and to add on to that, I think this question is also getting to the concern that like, if you live in a big city and there are going to be a ton of buildings around you or for DC specifically, you live near an airport, very close to an airport, if that's something that ever could be feasible for you. Um, Scott, would you mind starting us off? Sorry about that, I had a weird pop up. Uh, there, There's a couple of different considerations in there that we're talking about. So DC specifically, you have the FRZ, the flight restriction zone, just mm -hmm. because of the sort of security risk that's associated with our the seat of our government being there right mm -hmm. and so even if you're in a traditional aircraft and you want to fly there there are a lot of hoops that you need to jump through there's a lot mm -hmm. of considerations that come into play so we have to think about something like drone delivery we haven't talked touched on sort of the the cyber security side of this the the secure national security side of this of how are those communication links handled what sorts of information is gathered based on the sensors that are on the drones themselves and based on where they come from, who manufactures them, who operates mm -hmm. them. So that that's one piece of it. And so if you the FAA right now is going going through this detection and mitigation arc or more kind of normal parlance be counter UAS. Um, mm -hmm. So our, our my boss, Michael Robbins, is one of the co-chairs of, of that aviation rulemaking committee. So they're working with sort of large public venue owners, airports, the FAA, uh, companies that are building this sort of detection and potential mitigation equipment of mm -hmm. we want to know who's operating the aircraft, who's operating an aircraft, what is their intent, and do we need to worry about it or not? So getting comfortable from, it from that perspective and then operating in an urban environment or near airports, you have to consider something. There's the con this concept and, and 
sort of nuanced sort of new version of air traffic called UTM. It's this unmanned mm -hmm. universal traffic management where aircraft are essentially using sensors and flight planning to say, this is where I'm going to be. This is the volume of airspace I want to operate within. And everyone is sort of feeding into that ecosystem so that you have deconfliction that happens based off of, I know that my air aircraft is planning to be here based off of the route planning. And this other mm -hmm. one is planning to be here and we're not going to run into each other and not overwhelming existing air traffic control systems that are in place. Um, if you want to operate near an, an airport now and you're, you're flying a drone, the larger commercial air uh, airports in the United States have what's called Lance, the low altitude <laughs> authorization notification capability. Essentially, you take a five mile circle, you draw it around the airport and you put grids in it. And in each okay. grid, the airport itself establishes a maximum operational height that they want an aircraft to operate in. So that's considering risk based on the, the pattern, based on takeoff and, takeoff and approach airlines. And you have to coordinate with air traffic control locally at that airport. Or if you're underneath the sort of prescribed maximum height, you can do that via uh, um, an author automated process in Lance. Uh, so the, all of these things will come, but I would likely say that this is gonna happen in sort of lower pressure environments first. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that we know how to solve those more complex items, yeah. but let's do it probably on a smaller scale. That's why you see in the DFW area, it's more in like northern suburbs where this is happening right now, where Wing mm -hmm. is operating, where Drone Up is operating, where Flytrex is operating. And they're working on a shared UTM concept together that was announced within the last couple of weeks. So th there's a lot of development that's happening and all those considerations are coming into play and larger, more denser cities and more security averse or concerned areas will come into play, but these, those likely will not necessarily be the first places where this happens. Yeah, no, for sure. Especially considering the like security impacts for DC specifically. Um, moving on to our second question. Our second question asks, is drone delivery energy efficient and how does it compare to other modes of delivery? So if either of you are able to speak to that, obviously you had mentioned earlier, it uses electricity and some of the advancements in electric vehicles have really made drones more capable just because we are building bigger and more better batteries. So it depends on the aircraft and it depends on mm -hmm. what you're measuring against. You know, if it's one drone carrying one piece of, uh, you know, something that weighs less than five pounds versus like an Uber Eats delivery where it's mm -hmm. one person delivering one package, that's a different consideration than a UPS and a very efficient large truck that's delivering hundreds of packages on a route. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you're talking about an aircraft that uses wingborne flight, so in forward flight, it's not having to use as much electricity to hold itself up and hover. It's getting mm -hmm. that wingborne effect that you get like on an airplane. Uh, mm -hmm. I think if you look, Zipline has done some good considerations. They're one of the drone delivery companies that talks about sort of the, the energy considerations. Overall, mm -hmm. what you're talking about, most of these aircraft are electric. So depending on the source of that electricity, they could be very green, they could be very efficient. The, the idea is to take road, take cars off of the road that don't need to be there if you're able to do it mm -hmm. via drone. But it really just comes down to the specific of what you're measuring it against. Yeah, I, I'd echo that wholeheartedly. That was one of the things we looked at in our, in our, when we're looking at our rural use case scenarios of, mm -hmm. hey, the UPS truck that's covering 50 miles to deliver 50 packages, you know, winding through a rural area, if that, in, if the scenario exists that, hey, the truck can deploy the drone while it's also delivering packages, you cut out some of that back and forth and through communities and, and some of mm -hmm. that, which is particularly interesting on that side. And I think um probably within the next couple of weeks we're going to be able to release the study that we did here in michigan but we did look at that sort of traffic congestion offset situation in our urban environments of mm -hmm. hey if uas become able to carry heavier packages and take some of that off the roads what's the trade-off there and found some good info so be sure to share that with you guys as well oh yeah no that sounds incredibly interesting i'll be very interested to see that when it does release um, we have a couple more audience questions that I want to run through. I know we're running out of time, but um, our third question, if either of you could speak to it, asks, how committed is the Biden administration to commercial drones and what rules have they issued recently? So we've, we've worked with the, the Biden administration on some things. Um, 
there have been sort of continuing executive orders um, around country of origin that kind of focuses on security. They've also looked at one of the things that Brian mentioned were sort of these critical infrastructure sites um, mm -hmm. on what are ways that we can get to essentially a prior FAA reauthorization talked about section 2209, 2209, which is a way for the Federal Aviation Administration to establish specific sites as critical infrastructure and to sort of limit access of aircraft over those pieces of infrastructure. We're put working with them on getting that made into a rule itself, also leaning heavily in with them on the beyond visual line of sight rules and ways that we can speed up those approvals that are happening now. I think one of the most helpful things that we could have from the Biden administration right now is getting to uh, a non no longer having an acting FAA administrator. There are a lot of positions at the FAA right now that are being filled by acting uh, employees, not mm -hmm. those, let's get a true appointment, let's get one that is you know, bipartisan backed, and then we have somebody who's able to go forth and, and handle issues, not only drones, but also traditional aviation side, so that everybody understands what's going on and we're not worried about what the next step's gonna be, who's gonna be in place. Um, kind of jumping off of that, our next question asks, the military has an increasing number of unmanned systems. Do you see challenges in marrying military and civilian UAS policy, especially at the state and local level? Um, and Brian, if you could provide a little bit of a state perspective, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as of now, we don't foresee a lot of challenges there. Obviously, the airspace, like Scott mentioned, is is primarily a federal function, and, and mm -hmm. there's been a system in place to, to cohabitate between military and civilian aircraft for a long, long time. I think what we see, at least in Michigan here, you know, there's a... The, I think the overarching feel in many cases is the is the military and DOD can help drive some of the technological advancements. So, so okay. there's always a desire to have that military component, you know, training and developing and and initially deploying within a state to help with all the ancillary civilian benefits that come along with a strong military, you know, buildup of this technology. And I think okay. that's one of the things we see in Michigan also with um our existing military units here and the airspace that Michigan provides in terms of military operating areas already that can that can allow for some of that co-mingling to occur in, in a pretty safe space. Uh, that's where we spent some time to, to really, you know, the military's got to do their thing and the civilian side's got to do their thing, but there's a there's an opportunity for those to operate together that, that really can build off what's existed for many years. And one of the things we also see about that collaboration between the military side and the civil side is dual use technology, whether that are things that are funded through Civer Sitter, you know, those types of grant opportunities and operations, as well as the knowledge that comes out of the, our personnel that are coming from the military. They have a lot of experience operating these unmanned and uncrewed systems, whether that's in theater or remotely. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need, as this grows, people that understand how these aircraft operate, how to service them, and, and how they integrate into the airspace that we have here. Sort of speaking of some of the military aspects, um, one of our questions says, what sort of input are you seeing from pilot trade organizations and unions such as AP, ALPA in the space of drone adoption and utilization? At least, at least on the state side, I think it's probably occurring on the federal side is, is everybody's got uh, a little bit of an input and a little bit of a role to play you know, I think, as Scott mentioned, the the sort of see and avoid, detect and avoid stuff has been around for a long, long time. I think that'll continue until the technology is perfected. Um, but, you know, everybody's got a voice and everybody and everybody's got a legitimate voice in, in, in sharing those perspectives. And I think at least on the state level for the things that we can engage in, you know, the more the more input we get from industry and, and trade organizations, the better. Mm hmm. Yeah, we, we do a lot of coalition collaboration across associations, whether that's small drones to advanced air mobility and EV tall aircraft to traditional aircraft or commercial air runners. You know, I think that one of the things that we don't hear talked about a ton is the technological innovation that's happening with drones as far as airspace awareness and avoidance that can be integrated into traditional aircraft into making sure that we have the safest airspace possible whether that's ADSB on board of aircraft so that drones know where those aircraft are finding okay. ways for traditional aircraft that don't have electrical systems on board to be electronically seen by drones and other 
users of the airspace is a great path forward. One of the things that's coming in the current FAA reauthorization is another uh, stipend or rebate for aircraft being able to equip. So how do we get to a regulatory pathway where the certification requirement for that piece of equipment on an airplane versus what's on an aircraft on a drone are sort of jived and mm -hmm. allowing for us to have sort of the safest view and picture of the airspace possible. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We're about at the end of time. So I think we'll wrap up right now. But I just want to say thank you both so much for joining. Um, this has been a really great discussion. I feel like we have had a lot of really, really good insights. Um, thank you guys so much. And thank you to our audience for joining today as well. Thank you. Thanks.